Well, welcome to everyone to the PyroLife International Symposium uh, towards an integrated fire management. In 2019, that's last year, um, the world was all on fire. Um, if you remember, the Arctic Circle, including Greenland, was on fire in June and into July. And then the Amazon region caught fire. Then Indonesia caught fire. And then about August, Australia had been burning and it really picked up on what it was doing. And so the whole world was talking about fire until COVID-19. And this is something that we really need to note very carefully. Fire is very much an ephemeral, intermittent sort of an activity. As soon as something else comes into the mix, then fires are off the front page. That's part of the reason that working with PyroLife to cross disciplines, cross sectors, uh, and cross uh, governments and, and agencies is a really important thing. So what, what can we do? We can help each other. We can collate local data and other data. We can present the information without interpretation. That requires context. So why should we go to adaptive fire management? Huh? I think similar to water, the risks are changing. We see above in time, we might get fires more often, but also in space, and those might be even more risky. Is we might get fires in places and areas where we're not prepared for it. Now, the future is uncertain, so we don't know where fires will emerge in the future. Because it's more uncertain, uh, developing scenarios might be even more useful uh, to, to, to assess the robustness of future policies and interventions. But we, we try to think about what does a major fire look like and what do we need to do to protect ourselves. It is important that, that we realize that we cannot build the future on what we've learned in the past. We have to go beyond that. Traditionally, an extreme fire is a fire that cannot be controlled or suppressed by direct methods. So by machinery or by water or by hand tools acting on the fire front. And so people also define fire behavior thresholds that define when a wildfire is extreme. And these thresholds are mostly uh, based on uh, fire intensity, or sometimes fire spread rate. More recently, people address this issue by selecting a particular type of extreme fire behavior. So when the fires do not display steady fire spread, so they can display rapid changes, rapid increases in, in uh, rate of spread, for example, for other people, um, an extreme fire, it's one that has catastrophic impacts. It has these impacts in people, in buildings, infrastructure, and especially when people die in these fires, such as those that recently occurred in Greece and in Portugal. We are having third, fourth, fifth, and sixth generation wildfires in fire-prone countries of Southern Europe. And at the same time, Central and Northern Europe is having first and second generations of wildfires. So the scenario across Europe is very challenging as this is a completely different picture of what we had 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. But what about the future? Wildfires in general are changing faster than science production under the current research model. And this is why management and research need each other in this journey to immediately address the challenges. So it's about finding shared interest and common grounds. It's about envisioning uh, your focus uh, and especially about mobilizing. So constantly zooming uh, out and in between the different skills. So from a regional, uh, national perspective, a regional perspective and a local perspective. And it's more than just focusing on natural areas or agricultural areas, but really about the connections. Now I'm going to show you some examples we are providing for several fire agencies. We integrate fire modeling, I mean fire simulation and fire progression, 
how we integrate uh, satellite data from BIRS and MODIS and how we integrate weather from weather stations and forecast weather station. So this is based on science because here we are using the best of um, fire modeling based on many, many disciplines because we are considering the the models but we are only we are using cartography to map the fields we are using phenology analysis so we need to combine all these disciplines to create uh, extreme products like like this one and uh, offer uh, good tools for decision making so if we focus on this issue at the urban fire part those initial ignitions how they're occurring, what can be done about that, and who can play a part in that uh, focus. We can stop them. That stops the overwhelmed fire suppression, that stops uh, the reduced uh, fire protection, the effectiveness, and it stops the disaster from occurring. It breaks that inevitable cycle. Thus, it, it, it takes us to, I think, a, a better understanding of what can occur. That it's the embers, not the fire front, that threaten homes, and that the resident-led model uh, has advantages for social behavioral change. It's this idea of empowerment. Who are you trying to empower? What information are you bringing to do that? And then how do you see them acting uh, in an effort going forward? The way out of these is managing. And the landscape is not investing in emergency. The decisions we make today are already what creates the future landscape. So if we decide to create a mosaic of landscape, that will help us. If we try to keep the continuity that will play against us, it's not a defensive moment, it's a creative moment. And this responsibility cannot be carried over the shoulder of a fire service. We want to share it. And that's why we are explaining that to our politicians. But we need the support of science behind because there is not a lot of data. The expert committee was appointed by the Portuguese government which concluded the same thing that uh, the Athens Committee concluded, a need for active involvement of uh, the society. A switch from a state center approach to a model relevant to the society. And among other recommendations, there was the creation of a national uh, fire forest uh, management program that involved the different entities of civil society in the state. So in other words, a redesign of fire policy towards doing, towards uh, designing a policy. It is not gonna be state-centered, but it is gonna be a, an action, it is gonna be a policy, it is gonna be a culture that is gonna be shared with the um, citizen. I don't think it's possible to talk about fire safety inequality in the UK without talking about the Grenfell Tower fire. The deadliest fire in the UK since World War II Grenfell showed the world that building fires are not a historic problem. Grenfell Tower is located in the borough of Kensington and Chelsea, which has the highest income inequality of all boroughs in the United Kingdom. You can see Grenfell was located in one of the most deprived neighborhoods in the borough. It is worth noting, however, that income inequality can be seen by simply crossing the street from the tower. In addition to the fact that Grenfell was a social housing block, the tragedy unveiled fire safety inequalities with building design and management across the UK and across the world, especially regarding vulnerable persons, including the elderly, children, and persons with disabilities. It also highlighted the importance of local context for fire safety design and public education. Our cities are becoming more diverse. The occupants of the tower were a diverse group of people of all backgrounds, ages, ethnicities, and origins. Some had grown up in North Kensington and had lived there all their lives. Others have come to the UK as refugees, in many cases from North Africa, the Middle East, Afghanistan, or further afield. We need to design and manage buildings based on evidence and insights onto how fire affects diverse populations, recognizing cultural differences in our relationships with fire and fire safety, as well as the impact of changing demographics. This will require more research and new ways of working. First of all, be before we start changing fire, management and how we manage and live with fire, we need to change our risk culture, our perceptions, our opinions, our values. And um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that I'm past that stage. I try to do it, but this is far more complicated than managing fire, far more complicated. Um, for that, um, based on the 20 some years that I can look back, um, my conclusion is 
we need the change. Um, for that, you need a lot of friends. Um, make them make friends before you need them. We said this often in the past webinars. Um, Pure Life, all the other projects, Paul Costa Foundation, you name it. This is all incredibly important um, to form friendships and networks. Why? Um, I'm speaking again out of own experience. You need reassurance because you will be alone. You will be very, very lonely in your home country or in your new environment. You will be lonely in your own organization. Um, if you really want to be the change that is allowing for better fire management or integrated fire management or living with fire um, in a society. When we look at social reality, it's like looking through a kaleidoscope that has many different colors, many different patterns, and with a small movement in the kaleidoscope, everything changes. So it makes uh, quite complex to approach social reality. All these uh, complex factors uh, are connected to each other. Usually we talk that we need to move from top-down approaches in risk management, which are mostly based in instruction, towards bottom-up approaches based on participation. But even with those bottom-up approaches, many times we forget many social groups. Uh, we have many blind spots uh, referred to marginalized groups, social vulnerability dimensions. So I suggest to, to, to take this outside in approach to think from these outsider spaces, which is the best way that we can change and transform the whole uh, process and risk management approaches. If we want to talk about vulnerability, we need to go to the root cases. It means in the first place, we have to listen and learn. Australia is a really large continent. There are hundreds of dis distinct indigenous cultural groups, each with their own specific cultural protocols relating to caring for country, including cultural burning. And this diversity means that in some cultural groups, women hold the knowledge of cultural burning. In some places, cultural burning is women's business. And these cultural protocols have to be honoured in our cultural activities. But even with the diversity across Australia, there are principles that underpin our Indigenous caring for country practice. And these are upholding healthy, sustainable relationships with country. Fire is a key part of caring for country to create sustainable relationships with all of life by reduce, reducing the risks of wildfire, promoting resources, food, and continuing natural and cultural life cycles. We focused on the Māori community, really um, looked at their Indigenous knowledge um, and the manner in which they provided and cared for over a thousand stranded tourists um, and also those displaced in the community without any um, assistance or a plan with their local government. Really what they did was they just demonstrated the value of their networks, their connection to the, um, the tribe of the South Island, um, Naitahu, and um, they, their capacity to adapt. Um, they didn't have stored food, they didn't have stored water, but hey, they did it. Resilience and associated resistance is culturally empowering, transformative, concerned with cultural participation and cultural development, and above all, commands solid cultural leadership. And um, I think we have a lot to learn um, for the future. So really diversity is key in Paralife, both inter and transdisciplinary, cross geography, cross risk, science practice, and, and social diversity. We focus on this diversity and this safe working climate because we really believe we can make the science better. If we want to go from suppression to uh, integrated fire management, we need to hear all voices. And that's only possible if the team that we work with, if the, if the fire science community, um, if that is a diverse community. Otherwise, the, the voices that we hear and the, and the solutions that we explore will be, will be biased um, into a certain direction.